Welcome, this is uh, episode 2 of Black History Month interview and uh, my name is Caduce. And my name is Devin and we're here with Nasira. For those who don't know, how about we start by you telling us about a little bit about yourself. I'm a senior, I play basketball and flag football and I am the Seattle Public Schools student representation. Uh, who got you into this activism at a young age? I mean, I kind of got myself into it. I faced a lot of like challenges growing up and through that I kind of realized that if I don't advocate for myself no one else will so that's how I got into it. What or who motivates you? Um, my family motivates me, my friends, but also I think that you know seeing the outcome when making a difference is what motivates me and keeps me pushing that knowing that I'm actually making effects and making changes in the world actually keeps me going. What are some uh, accomplishments you're proud of? One of the main accomplishments that I'm proud of, I think I'd say, is the board, um, being on the school board, being able to represent the 50,000 students, and giving a voice for black girls especially, I think is one of the biggest accomplishments that I've had. Yeah, plans to continue your work after graduating since you're a senior? Um, yeah, I plan to major in political science and start like continuing my work in there, but also um, coming back to my community, helping out as usual. I usually already help my community out a lot, so I think I will be coming back often if I don't end up staying in state and doing as well what I can. All right, that's it from Devin. I do. Uh, and and thank, thank you guys for watching. I right. hope you guys enjoy it. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm student board member Nasira Hassan, and I'm delighted to be announcing the proclamation of Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action 2023 and Year of Purpose 2022 to 23. A proclamation of Seattle School District Number One, King County, Seattle, Washington, declaring the lives of black students matter and recognizing and encouraging participation district-wide in the National 2023 Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action, February 6th through February 10th, 2023, and Year of Purpose 2022 to 2023. Whereas the Black Lives Matter school movement began in Seattle in the fall of 2016 through the leadership of educators and whereas the school, Seattle School Board has repeatedly recognized and encouraged participation in Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action and the Year of Purpose and whereas the Seattle School Board has also recognized that throughout our nation's history, institutional and structural racism and injustice have led to deepening and racial dis racial disparities across all sectors of society and have lasting negative consequences for our communities, cities, and nation. And whereas, as a public school district, we are facilitators of the limitless growth potential of human beings with a charge to guide our youth in finding and achieving their purpose with the belief that every human begin every human being deserves to live with dignity and whereas in board policy number 0030 ensuring educational and racial equality Seattle's public schools makes a commitment to the success of every student in each of our schools and charge district staff administrators instructors communities and families with this broadly shared responsibility and whereas in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in 2020 and countless black named and unnamed victims, the Seattle School Board adopted resolution number 2019-20-30 to affirm Seattle Public Schools is committed to the safety of black students and resolves that black lives don't just matter, they are worthy, beloved, and needed, and therefore, Seattle Public School declare that the lives of black students matter and hereby proclaim February 6th through February 10th, 2023 as Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action and encourages participation district-wide through discussions in classrooms and in homes throughout this week of action and the 2022-2023 year of purpose. What a nice elevator. So well made and really cool. Alexander Miles was born in 1838 in Ohio. He became a very successful barber and got into real estate as an adult. At his real estate office, he made many rides on an elevator and realized the dangers of falling off the elevator shaft and knew it had to change. After much research, he pat patented the elevator electric door, changing the way we moved up and down first floors. All right, my name is Tyler Jones. I'm from Chief Self International High School, and I'm a junior. Um, 
But anyway, Mr. Emery, uh, tell us about yourself and how you got involved with Kingmakers. Oh, goodness. I've been in the education field for almost the last 30 years, uh, specifically the last 28 years with the Seattle Public School District. Um, years ago, I used to teach special education at Madison Middle School. Um, I had a good friend of mine that worked at interagency high school, um, and I got kind of pinged and uh, asked what I want to come to interagency and, and, and possibly teach. And at that point, I really, I didn't really have a desire to do high school per se. So again, the opportunity to teach high school kind of, you know, knocked on my door several years later. And at this point, I decided to kind of go ahead and, and um, take the opportunity and give it a shot. And so probably about well, about three or four years into teaching, I got asked to teach a program called Kingmakers. And Kingmakers was a program that was started uh, down in Oakland, California by Chris Chapman uh, probably about 12 years ago. And it was basically started to really help kind of uh, increase the graduation rate, uh, cut down on the incarceration rate, and really basically just a, a program that's designed specifically for young African-American men that uh, were essentially the furthest away from the education system. It's a program designed and developed to kind of help them truly see the greatness that, uh, you know, that the innate greatness, greatness that each of them have within them. What is Kingmakers Extended and how can chief self students get involved? Well, Kingmakers Extended is basically because seven years ago we did this as a pilot and it was um, the only schools that had it at that time were interagency high school, uh, Asa Mercer Middle School, Denny International School, and Aki Karosi Middle School. Um, and what we saw through the first couple years of, of, of doing this program, we were like, whoa, these young African-American men, they are really kind of locking into to a lot of the history and um, a lot of the concepts, we saw the, 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 the desire and the hunger for other schools wanting this program. And so what we did was we came up with Kingmakers Extended, which is an afternoon uh, Kingmakers class that is done um, solely virtually. What else do you want to share about the work you're doing in the district? I, I believe, I believe, um, and you can call me uh, crazy, you can call me a visionary, <clears throat> you can call me what you want. I've literally seen this program not just change the lives, watch this, not just change the lives of the young black men individually, okay? I've watched this program shift the culture in schools. I've watched this, this, this program shift the cultures at home. And I can see by 2025, this program being in, in at least, because right now it's in six of the Seattle public schools um, but so that tells me we've got another 19. So we got to work fast because I believe that by 2025, we're going to have this program. Um, and at least at least 25 of the Seattle public schools um, in the school district. Thank you so much. And that's our time for um, this interview. Thank you so much, Mr. Emery, for for your for your words. Man. It, it's really inspiring. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Black History Show. I'm Jamal and I'm a senior here. I'm Jason, I'm a junior. Uh, I'm just trying to get all of my assignments in before the end of the semester. For those of you who don't know, it's on February 8th. Try and get all of your, all the work you need to get turned in. So, Jamal, what's the topic for today's episode? Today we're going to be talking about redlining and how our community has been affected. Redlining was a financial policy that was practiced officially from the 1930s to the late 60s. Under the policy, banks were legally allowed to deny people of color from receiving home loans. You want to tell our viewers more about what that means? Yes. This meant that black folks, immigrants, and other people of color groups were restricted from getting home loans in certain areas during that time. On top of that, there's also something called racial restricted covenants. Na neighborhoods like High Point, Alki, and South End all had restrictions that prevented black, Asian, and immigrant families from living in the neighborhood unless they're fulfilling a servant role. The value of homes in the area have drastically increased since the 60s, and many of those homes stay within the families that own them. Or money can be used from the sale of their property. This goes back to our conversation we had last week about generational wealth. The barriers to home ownership made it difficult for black folks to be able to make up 250 years of injustice. This experience was similar for other communities of color residing in the area. So, the BIPOC community, community and immigrants 
struggled to reside in the West Seattle area, which spaces were more accessible to live in? The Central District, the International District were the two big neighborhoods and did not have restrictive covenants against BIPOC homeowners. To this day, these areas are still home to a large number of black and brown folks. But with the policy of redlining ending and the racial and restrictive covenants technically ending with Fair Housing Act, in 1968, the community has been able to spread about the entire city of Seattle, as you can see here at Chief Self International. So basically, as usual, it took an act of Congress to end years of systemic housing injustice for black and brown folks. But you actually can still see rules of restricted covenants on present day documents like house deeds or title reports. That some of the adults around us who own homes may or may not be surprised by what they see if they make a little. We also need to talk about the fact that banks used to, red, used to use red line maps to guide investments and businesses in specific areas. In the red line areas or spaces deemed hazardous, lenders will be less likely to give loans in this area. That means less reinvestment in the community, less opportunities for the community to thrive, while other areas receive all the funding and advancement support. This policy was more than home ownership restrictions. So the area has become more diverse, but at the same time, the space that black and brown businesses have resided for decades are now changing. Oh yeah, and gentrification in the central and international district is not cute. White Center and Burien are next, but how do we come to terms with our neighborhoods and communities changing? I think we have to continue supporting as many BIPOC owned businesses in our community as we can. We have Orchid Cards. Why not take a trip down to the Central District to try the juice bar from last week's episode or find a black owned food spot? Oh, that's a great idea. I mean, that's why we're putting on Spotlight on black owned businesses this month. But we need to be supporting black and brown businesses all year round. Mm -hmm. Of course. So if you guys know black and brown businesses that we should shout out and support, let us know in this week's feedback survey. Let's do our part and support our community. I think we have time for an interview with someone who can tell us more about what Seattle was like and why this topic matters so much. Hey y'all, it's Jamal. I'm back here with an interview. Today I'm here with... Bill Ellaby, the guru. Clarence Robinson, the best. So, y'all are from the Central District, right? Yes. What was it like growing up there? I mean, it was a, a special place to be there. I went to Garfield High School there and it was um, real special. Uh, a black community, uh, uh, black ownership of businesses, um, had black teachers, a black principal, and it was a it was a brotherhood. You know, it was it was it was really really something special. Black community. Yeah. Man, it was it was amazing. Look at um, I came up through this '60s and the '70s, and it was a lot of togetherness in the black community because it was a zoned area, so. Pretty much it was primarily black, you know, and it was great seeing black home ownership at that point because everybody grew up in the house. I barely knew anybody that lived in an apartment. Everybody lived in the house. We had the Black Festival, which it started sometime in the early 50s, and they would have a parade that went down uh, 23rd from Madison all the way to Jackson. And it was it was really special. What was it like to transition to a gentrified CD? Like, what was the change like for you guys? Well, it really hurt me. Um, I was really sad because a lot of the business started disappearing. I mean, what? You know, Sandler's right. Burgers, Miss yeah. Helen's, yeah. all disappearing. Everything was just missing. Everything was gone at that point. My grandparents home. Um, is on the corner of 24th and Columbia, which is um, a block north of Garfield High School. And my grandfather bought that house in 1959 for $18,000. My grandfather was a longshoreman, paid that house off by 1964. Time after he passed, the taxes for a lot of the, the older black folks that lived in the area, they got priced out of that house because of taxes, a lot of them lost their houses. So it was like everybody was sticking together, basically. Yeah. Wash each other's backs, that whole... Like, well, everybody knew each other, like even when I was coming up. You might have went to elementary school with, with a group of people. And you split off, went to middle school, and they went to one, you went to another one. Then we might have came back together in high school. Like the three black schools were, Garfield was the main one in Franklin, Cleveland, and Rainer Beach. So it was always a rivalry because we were all in the same division of us fighting against each other for making it to Metro. 
So after the games on Fridays, you know, we head there and everybody had their bragging rights for the for the night. And then the other hangout was it was a place called Skipper's Fish, and it was one in Columbia City, and they had all you can eat fish on Tuesday. Yeah. And man, we were gonna raid that joint. So you imagine a bunch of teenagers going in there, and it was only two dollars and fifty cents to get your fish. And you know, we just tell them, keep dropping that fish, keep dropping that fish, because we're coming to get that fish. And it, and it was, and it was no, what, you know. We didn't have all those beef, but wasn't no. It wasn't know, no guns. It wasn't nobody doing that. I mean, we 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 fought. We fought this city another day. You right. Know? I mean, you know, I was a star. I was a star at Garfield. My brother was a star at Franklin. We were we were a family. We fought. The community leaders brought us together. We had a meeting. Brought us, our schools together to not go over that line. Right. I think that's all of the questions that we have. Is there anything else you guys would like to? I want to say thank you again. There's so much stuff. There's so many stories. We just get started. I think you made a good point. She made a good point. The story made a good point that we do still have black ministers in the city that we need to support. Right. You know, we it's sad about the past, but moving forward, we we can well support those black ministers. We can still celebrate what we have, and you know. Try to come together as a community the best we can. I mean, we can't let the we can't let the legacy of CD just go like oh, that. Yeah. Not without a fight. So we're, there's still black people in the community fighting. We still want to come together. Now that was a TED talk I needed. I feel like we've covered so much in this week's episode. It's time for a recap. Well, we got to give the people what they want. Today we covered the Great Depression and area housing policy called redlining. Redlining created another barrier for black and immigrant families to get past to be able to own a home. Let's not forget about how vendors used red line maps to, able to be able to determine where loans would be safest at, which resulted in a credit and investment disparity in black and immigrant neighborhoods like the CD and International District. We also can't forget that we brought up gentrification, which is when people who have more money on hand buy their way into black and brown neighborhoods and totally change the way the area looks. The culture of the area is altered and long-term residents in the neighborhood get pushed out. That's why we need to support BIPOC businesses to help maintain their space in their community. So again, let us know what businesses we should shout out next week for everyone to go support. Thank you all for another week of the Black History Show. Tune in next week for our final episode. And don't forget to check out 100 years of recorded music tribute happening in the auditorium tomorrow and next Thursday during 6th period. And make sure you come support our live event next week on Thursday. There's going to be music, food, and more. That's, That's it, it for us. us. See you all next week. Hi, my name's Kaden. I'm a, I'm a freshman and I'm with Jasmine Walker, owner and founder of City of Curls Mobile Beauty Supply. So, why did you start selling hair products? So I started selling hair products in the height of the pandemic. I was torn in between my job and wanting to be a business owner. Um, and I was on Clubhouse. Do you, you remember on Clubhouse? You guys know about Clubhouse? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's like an iPhone. Um, so Clubhouse, they were teaching people. It was, um, it was people in the beauty supply industry that were already established. They were teaching people how to open up beauty supply stores. And so that's how I got started. And I was like, well, I don't have enough to open up a beauty supply store, but I could turn it into a mobile beauty supply store. Do you do hair in your personal time? I do family's hair on my personal time, but I don't like charge clients on my personal time. Um, I do want to learn how to start getting better, and so I can branch off into an LLC and do children and foster care's hair for free. Can you tell me more about that? Yes. Um, actually, I was in foster care also um, when I was younger, and um, so I definitely know some of the needs that kids with curly, coily, kinky, and wavy hair have, um, and just to educate the parents also, because sometimes the parents don't have the same hair texture, they don't know how to do the kids' hair, so ultimately it would just be an educational and um, self-care experience for everybody. How does your business work? So our business works um, kind of like DoorDash. Um, if you're getting ready and you run out of hair products, hair tools, if you need your, if you need a wig, get your hair done, you know what I mean? And um, the beauty supply store is closed or you can't get to a beauty supply store, like especially for high school students, um, you guys can go on to our webpage, www.cityofcurlsbeautysupply.com and order anything you just ran out of or need last minute and your order will be delivered within an hour or less of your confirmation. How did you come up with your business name? So the business name City of Curls, it was just us trying to 
be inclusive of all the shades in our community. And um, one thing that we all share in common is like, you know, our hair and the pride we take in our hair. So we all got curls, coils, kinks, and waves. Any advice for any teens that's about to start a business? Yes. Um, if you're interested in starting a business or anything, uh, I would definitely say let it be something you're already passionate about, something that you're already good at. Growing up, honestly, I thought all I could do was play sports. I thought that was my gift. And um, I had to, real, you know, over time I learned and grew that, you know, some of my gifts are talking, some of my gifts are giving back. And so whatever you're passionate about, just try to form it around that and figure out a way to make money from it. All right, that's all I have for today. Welcome to episode two. My name is Devin, and today I'm here with... Bill Ellaby, the guru. guru. All right, so we're just gonna get right into it. Uh, what made you wanna play basketball when you were younger? Man, this is a long story, I hope you got time. Uh, of course. When I was a kid, um, my mom, single mom, moved to my grandma's house a lot, and my uncle played basketball at Cleveland High School. Um, his name was Carl Irvin, rest in peace. He played this guy named Jawan Odom, who was seven feet. And another guy was 6'8". Um, and they were a great basketball team. Uh, they won state championship two years in a row. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with them guys at my grandma's house. All their friends would come by, we would play basketball. And that got me loving the game. But uh, I think all that time, hanging around them and just being around the game, uh, really prepared me to want to be great in basketball. The second question is, how did you get into coaching? I went to Cal Brooklyn, I played there. Um, had a good four years there. Started for two or three years there. Um, set the three-point record, and then um, I was going to play in the CBA. Which th at the time, CBA was like the G League of the NBA. That was my goal to go to the NBA. Um, mm -hmm. It was uh, the minor leagues of the NBA, so I played the CBA in Yakima, for Yakima Sun Kings. And then I got waived, and I came home. My mom wanted me to go to school, so I went back to Cal Berkeley to finish my schooling. And my coach, Lou Campanelli, who just passed away a few days ago, rest in peace, kind of said, yeah, I've been heavy heart with that, thank you. Um, he had got fired uh, from the job, and so they hired one of the assistant coaches named Todd Bozeman. And um, I, was there the, I was there every day practicing at Cal, just trying to get in shape, and get back and go, go play overseas. The coach got fired, they needed somebody to help. help. So the kids asked me to help, they said, but we want you to help. You know, they had a great team, they had this kid named Jason Kidd, who was a great player, Lamont Murray, Yogi Stewart, all these guys was NBA. so I went down there and started coaching. And kind of rest was history, man. All right, the last question is, what else should we know about sports in the area, like in the Washington, Seattle area? I mean, Seattle's a hotbed for basketball right now. We have a lot mm -hmm. of guys that's going to the NBA that's playing college basketball, you know. Um, but, you know, I think that it's a, it's a testament to this area that we've always been great in basketball, mm -hmm. but we never really got the exposure that we deserved, exactly. you know. And, you know, all these kids going to the NBA and want to play college basketball. That's important. And for me, it's really about these kids getting education. I mean, everybody's not going to the NBA. You know, that was my dream. You know, God bless me. You know, my son gave him an opportunity for me to kind of live through him. You know, that, that's a blessing for me. But you know, the other side is, you know, kids can go play college basketball, not just Division One, but Division Two, Division Three, JUCO, and just be able to, get, you know, get, get a college education and then play basketball, too, and have fun. I think that's just you know, uh, the biggest thing for me. All right, thank you for tuning in to the interview. Room. This is from Devin and the Guru. Guru. All right, thank you guys for watching. What's the best food at a cookout? Personally, for me, I like corn greens and mac and cheese. Mm. The ribs. I would say um, <laughs> fried chicken. Mac and cheese. Mac and cheese. Yeah. Um, some ribs. That chicken salad from 81st Deli. I love food. I, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to say the ribs. Uh, the ribs. The ribs. Macaroni and cheese. Hey man, hey man, you, you gotta get the collard greens on. Oh, I was gonna Ooh. say, I think I'm gonna go with the greens too. What part of your culture are you most proud of? The food. The food. I'll say the music. Um, I mean, I'm proud of everything and the challenges that we've overcome to get to the music. I'm 
proud that we've been through a lot of stuff, yet my black people, we always still have hope. You know what I mean? We're very strong. We're, we're people who are like very resilient. I like that regardless of anything we go through, we're still black kings and queens. You know what I mean? We're strong. Everything. I mean, it's the culture. Black innovation. Yes. We started and everybody wants to All those. <laughs> Do you as a black person feel like you are at a disadvantage in your academic school? You mean like I have a disadvantage? Like, like do you feel like you, yeah, do you no, feel like no, that no. at school? No. Did you feel like that in high school? Um in high school, yeah, but I think it all stemmed from like the household though. Um, sometimes, I think at the school I go to myself, I don't feel like I have a lot of disadvantages because there's a lot of people that are there for me. But I think in some environments, there are disadvantages. Uh, I did definitely uh, starting off in high school as well as in college, I would say yes, because most of the resources are not in our neighborhoods that we were raised in. <laughs> I definitely did going into college. I failed my first math, my first math class right away, and it was really embarrassing for me. And I had to do a lot of work to get caught up on that. But eventually, I was able to. Favorite African slash Black musician and favorite track. Hey girl, how you doing? My name is Charles. Last name is Wilson. Oh, me, I, first of all, I wasn't done. <laughs> okay. Um, probably like Gibby On or like SZA. I think they're like amazing. Or like J. Cole. I have to go with SZA. And, um, I'm gonna go with my my lovely girl Lizzo, okay? And special, like that whole album sings to me. Uh,